Well, hello everyone. I'm very pleased to be here and thanks to um, Tom for inviting me. So I I'm going to talk today about a technique that I've used very widely in my own research. It's one I think that's fair to say isn't actually that, that highly or that widely recognized uh, by researchers, but one I think is really, really useful for releasing the creative consumer. And this technique is personal introspection, sometimes referred to as subjective personal introspection. And there are three ways that I've really benefited from this technique. Um, first of all, I should say that the technique is, is really quite a simple one. It's where you are uh, an informant or one of your research team write uh, an account of their own reflections on the particular consumption phenomenon under study. And you try and be as creative as possible. You try and do it in a non-rational decision-making processing, etc., information processing way. And you just let, let the sort of stream of consciousness. And uh, as I said, I've used this in three different ways. I've used it uh, to write my own reflections on a, uh, on a, uh, a retail environment where I was studying the utopian imagination. And that was very beneficial because it really sensitized me to my research, to what I might expect, uh, how the informants would react. And it sensitized me to being creative about getting informants to be creative in a way that Marie was saying, you know, sensitizing me to, to the creativity I wanted to release in consumers. So I used it that way. I've used it also in conjunction with research teams, where we get the whole research team to reflect on the, on the uh, consumption phenomena under study, again, to sensitize ourselves and to better understand our consumers. And finally, I've used it widely in consumer research, getting informants to write accounts about uh, what I'm studying. And how I got onto this in the first place was because I was trying to understand the utopian imagination in a festival marketplace. Sorry, I haven't been holding this maybe as close as I should have. Uh, uh, I was trying to understand uh, a festival marketplace and the utopian uh, imagination in relation to that in a centre in Dublin. And first of all, I was doing lots of interviews with retailers and consumers. And then I was trying focus groups and in-depth interviews. And I really felt that I wasn't getting the creative side of what was happening in this place. So finally, I got consumers to write uh, introspective accounts. And this really generated a lot of very rich data that just hadn't been coming out in the other methods I've been trying. So you can see here, here's a, a couple of things that were really key in my conceptualization of the utopian imagination in that environment uh, and, and the subsequent theorization of the utopian processes, the utopian experience in consumer research. So you can see here, one person is writing, all things shone in the shop window, the light reflected on crystal, there were lights and walls, all shops <coughs> glittered, and it was a real pleasure to look at them. I had the feeling that I was in another place. This was very crucial, this removal, this sense of displace that happened with the utopian imagination. That part of the shopping center was very like I felt as in a castle. It was magic for me. I saw a lot of porcelain with well-finished design. Uh, the three shops were enchanting because I liked the way it was glinting. These were just very rich descriptions that hadn't been coming out in the other methods I'd been using. And the second one, as I walked down the narrow cobbled street, there wasn't, in fact, a cobbled street to, to the centre, but that didn't matter. It was this triggering of the imagination and the nostalgia that I really wanted to get at. So it, it, the fantasy mattered uh, more than the actual reality. And you can see it was as if the noise faded into the distance and one had the impression of going back in time, which was, again, a crucial part of the conceptualization of the utopian process, this removal from the present and being carried away. So that's how I got onto this technique, and I'm really a great advocate for it. I, I've used it again and again, and I really find that it unlocks, as I said, the, the consumer creativity. And that's really what I'm going to look at in this um, short time, and hopefully we'll have time to talk about it. You, you can ask me some things as well. Um, because uh, suffice it to say that subjective personal introspection has had a, a little bit of shaky history in consumer research. And I think it's probably because it has been primarily used um, by, 
by uh, scholars such as Morris Holbrook, Elizabeth Hirschman, Stephen Gould, and Stephen Brown, uh, reflecting on their own personal consumption behaviours. And uh, each of those is published in, in fairly well-known publications, particularly Steve Gould's notorious one where he was thinking about his own vital energy states mm -hmm. in JCR that caused a huge controversy. And so generally, this meant that people shied away from subjective personal introspection because it was seen as, uh, uh, Melanie Wandoff and, um, uh, and Brooke said, it was seen as very much an indulgence, a sample of one, uh, and very much just a kind of, you know, wacky way to, uh, to generate some uh, quick research, really. And uh, so people were very skeptical about it. But actually, it can really be justified in its own right. Um, there's a lot of um, there's a lot of historical techniques that feed into it that are well recognised and well justified. And the, the, the idea really is that it needs to be assessed primarily as an art and not a science. This is what Stephen Brown has always contended. And if I can just skip and then go back again. It's on this basis that art can often tell us more about consumption phenomenon and, and the creativity behind that. And here you have Emile Zola writing on the early department stores, the Bon Marche, and you can see in this wonderful description, I'm not going to read it all, but you can see he just captures the lure and the seduction of the department store and how it provokes all these desires in us. And you don't need a, a, a survey of 600 people to really uh, prove this, so to give us evidence. Emil Zola is, is capturing something. It's like uh, seeing the world in a grain of sand, really. It's this idea that art can really capture emotions and, uh, uh, and, and crucial desires. And you see this. I love this woman, pale with desire, leaned over. He's talking about all the materials and drapes you know, just being sort of spread out in this luxury display. And, of course, the, the spectacle as well. It's all captured here in this, this description. So, essentially, this is what uh, personal introspection is trying, to, uh, is trying to convey. It's trying to tap into. Now, we're obviously not going to be able to make ourselves or our informants Emil Zola, but we're trying to... That's what we're trying to encourage, this idea that art is as valuable as science in giving us insights. It also ties into all these other techniques, autobio autobiographical criticism in the humanities, which is well recognized um, in, in English literature, particularly psychology, autobiographical, uh, autobi uh, autobiographical memory, stream of consciousness, of course, uh, espoused by writers like James Joyce, and Coming more closely to marketing then, it actually links in with well-recognized marketing research techniques like thematic apperception tests where you're getting consumers to be creative, albeit in usually quite a controlled manner and under usually you know, controlled conditions, whether it's usually in a, in a room or whatever where you're, you're carrying out the, the research and in a very short way, but also um, uh, the, right, the creative writing espoused by Dergy as well, who's written about that in terms of marketing research. So again, it's not as wacky as it may first seem. Uh, it ties in with a lot of well-recognized techniques, uh, and it has a lot of justification, and I think can be uh, really, really uh, beneficial. But the, the key problem is how do you get informants to release their inner artist? You know, how do you really get them to write as creatively as possible. Because one of the really big problems that I found with this technique is that um, uh, people really uh, want to be rational, or they think you want them to be. I mean, that was the problem I was finding in the in-depth interviews I was trying to do in the, in the utopian research that I was telling you about. And even the focus groups, everybody is so marketized now. Everybody knows the language of marketing. And if they think that you're studying marketing phenomena or you know, consumer research phenomena, they automatically think they can second guess you. And they want to tell you the meaning of the advertising campaign, the meaning of, you know, they, they, they know more about marketing strategies than we do ourselves almost. 
So it's very hard to get them to switch that off and say, can you just go back to pretend you don't know anything about marketing and just <laughs> give me your feelings here? Uh, and this is really quite difficult not to be over analytic because uh, people just presume that. And particularly as the interviewer, you set up that bias that they want to impress you and show that they can be analytic as well. And so what I do is when I'm doing, uh, when I'm going to carry out introspections um, with informants, uh, I, I actually sort of do a bit of training or I talk to them beforehand to try and encourage them to kind of sweep away all this sort of analytic side and to come to it to focus on their impressions, their thoughts, their associations, their feelings, their emotions, all the things that the experience may trigger. And I tell them just to write in a stream of consciousness that they're not being judged. It's not a wrong or right here. It's just to try and be creative and not to be afraid to go off on tangents. If something makes them think of something else of something else, this is all great uh, fodder. That's what we want to hear. That's what creativity is about, the chains of associations, the links. Uh, and again, uh, you want that. You want them to go on a roll. So I really encourage them to do all this and to go away and reflect and be creative. Because really, and, and maybe it's I'm preempting the subject of Eric's uh, talk, but I think everybody is creative. Everybody has creativity in them. Uh, you know, and, and people like a chance to be creative. And if you say to them, I just want you to see what you can do with it, have fun, then I find that people really relate to that well. They like that, you know, because everybody, I don't think there's anybody that doesn't have some type of creativity in them. And it's just trying to release that, and that's, that's what this is doing. So at the moment, I'm actually carrying out research into the Don Le Noir restaurant chain, looking um, at the experience. It's Don Le Noir, and I'm carrying this out actually with an ESCP colleague, Elizabeth Tissio de Boer. And we've been doing this in Paris and in London for a couple of years now. And again, we're, we're carrying this out using personal introspection as the main method for this. And I should have said, of course, you can use personal introspections along with other methods, as I did in the Utopian Imagination. You can use it as a standalone method, but probably you want to use it in conjunction with other methods if you're going to try and get into a top journal, because you know, there's still a lot of uh, proving that has to be done about the technique, although I would argue you can use it on its own. Um, so here is just some of the things coming out here in one of the accounts. I chose this because I thought, again, these were things that I couldn't have got just sitting, uh, talking to the consumer in a face-to-face -face interview. And again, I won't read through it all because I want to get through everything here, but you can see She's talking very much here about the process and the things that are happening. And she's very much writing in a stream of consciousness way, which is really what this technique, I think, uh, does in a beautiful way. And you can see here, once settled down, I tried to think about something else, but it was just impossible. I needed to touch my face, my hair, my hands, and I feel everything was in the right place. Should have said for those of you that maybe don't know, Don Le Noir is where you go and eat in the dark. And it really is dark. You cannot see a thing. And so a lot of people find this actually a very unpleasant experience. They get very scared and they feel they're losing themselves, which is, is very interesting. And we're analysing this at the moment. Uh, this, is, this embodied reaction is one of our core uh, aspects that we think are really unique about this particular piece of research. And here's another one where you see... Uh, just very much taking you through the process here. Babbling voices were everywhere, and we were entering through the sea of voices led by Te Te Takeshi, the, the, the waiter, etc. And again, this is very much leading you in and giving you the feeling of the overall motion of the experience in, in ways, getting them to tell stories exactly about the experience. And so the difficulties, really, then, just to kind of sum up, because I think I'm pretty much nearly, how many minutes, Tom? Five, okay. So the difficulties here, as I said, are really because you're dealing with the written word. 
this is uh, is uh, not a problem, but it is restrictive because you you want maybe to get people to to be as creative as possible. Not everybody is necessarily creative through the text. Some people may want to paint. Some people may want to take photos. Some people want to, may want to play music. <laughs> Other people may want to express themselves in different things. So I think the technique could be developed uh, very much uh, to, to let people not just write, but to do other things if they want to as well. So I think it's quite exciting, actually, to think about the ways that it could be done, in, in, in uh, it, how it could be developed. And the length of the introspections. This is also a problem because people tend to, unless they really get in a role, they tend to find writing a bit um, tedious and, you know, it, getting them to write something that is a good length is also difficult. So I usually say that they should write, you don't want less really than about 400 words, but you really want to encourage them to go on. And usually I find once you do, people do write more, but there is no doubt they need encouragement to do this. And getting that length can be difficult. So more and more I now try and get people to use other things to take in photographs if they want, for example. To, to develop ideas if they want to put in cartoons and things as well, let them do that. Anything that gets them to, to really uh, develop their accounts. I've already spoken about this for all marketers now, and the, the whole aspect of encouraging creativity, because we're really taught, or we, we tend to think in an analytic way that feelings don't count, and we're embarrassed often to say them. That's the thing, and I think that's the thing with the interviews too, because people are often embarrassed. I find that again and again with interviewing the different uh, topics I've studied. People are, are often very reluctant to talk about their deeper feelings face to face, because there, there is embarrassment. And so finally then, <coughs> just in thinking about the future directions, what I think is a very exciting technique, um, we need to think of other ways to introspect, giving people disposable cameras. I know people have already done that in consumer research, actually, getting them to use just cameras. But what I'm arguing for would be blending the techniques of writing and uh, the photographic records. Camcorders, of course, can be a very exciting new way to do it, uh, as well as tape recording your diaries, you know, right, uh, tape recording every night, maybe about a particular phenomenon under study and your reflections. If somebody doesn't actually like to write, get them to um, record their feelings. And tapping into groups, because where do you find people that want to write these? Um, this is also the problem. And so tapping into some of the groups, creative writing groups, humanities students, book clubs, retirement groups, virtual communities, these can all provide ready groups of people uh, that may want to uh, to do writing for fun about a particular topic uh, and tapping into that. And, and I'll finish up there and just uh, take any questions you have. Thank you. Uh, I was wondering... Is there a particular threshold within the technique, so I mean you've been using it, uh, that you need to achieve for the information to be valid or is just any stream of consciousness useful? I think any stream of consciousness is, is useful because in interpretive research, which is obviously the perspective I'm coming from, we don't really talk so much about it being valid, you know, it's just whether it brings insights. And so, you know, I've known very small introspections. In fact, for the utopian imagination, some of the very small ones, people just actually wrote poems for me, and they, you know, they wrote um, poems of maybe four or five lines. Right. And actually, you know, those triggered things as well. So I think anything, but you, generally speaking, you want to, you want to generate as much material as you can, because obviously that brings more insights. Mm -hmm. But even the small ones okay. can. And so I always say to people. You don't want to write, you know, it's not something you want to be forced, so, you know, give me anything. But, right. uh, and then you usually find that people, you know, uh, want, want to write more. It's like students, they always say, oh, do we have to write that much? And then, you know, there are thousands over the word line, you know, yeah. I have a question whether you think that the take this photograph is quite the same thing, because introspection, you know, starts the idea of Yes. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
there's still that same gap that what you can photograph isn't exactly what you're feeling or thinking at the second you're looking at it. Yes, I mean, I agree with you. That That's why I, uh, I said that I think if the photograph is in conjunction with the reflection, I think otherwise the photographic record isn't the same, definitely. But I think it can be useful for to encourage people, if they're very visual, to take photographs, and that sometimes triggers their reflections, you know, because then I say, well, if you take photographs, and, and actually um, some people did this for the utopian imagination, well, they built in photographs through their reflections and reflected on the photograph, really, as a, I mean, in market research, again, that would be a common technique to, to generate, you know, photo collages and things to generate people to say things. So if it's used to trigger the introspection, then yes, but totally agree otherwise. Yeah. You know, just to uh, come back on this, <coughs> my reality, um, they call it photo voice, but it's very useful, mm -hmm. especially when you work with uh, younger children. Yes. They work with young care in Africa. Yeah. And they find that photo voice is a way for them to express their feelings much more. Ah, oh, yes. Yes. And what, what is it? It's program, is it? Um, um, what's photo voice? Yes, what's photo, photo voice? Photo voice is name. Oh, that would be the yeah. for technique. Okay. Uh, I thought it was a special, you know, yes. yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. They, they theorize that technique. Ah, right, okay. Yes, well, that's, that's yeah. Yes. I mean, I just think there's a lot more with this introspection. Uh, it has been overlooked. I think it's, you know, it's really kind of tap into lots of these other well recognized um, things, yeah. Yes, sir. Do you have any thoughts about uh, getting people to make things? Way of generating some yes, I mean, I hadn't thought of that, but yes, I mean, uh, yes, uh, um, because again, you could get them to sort of introspect through that, through the making, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I think that would be very good. I suppose the practicalities of that are slightly, maybe not, just to tell them to. Were you thinking of anything in particular, or any? No, I was thinking to accumulate a bunch of junk, whatever it might be. Yeah, like, and, and make your, Lego, yeah, yeah, yeah. Blocks, Lego, yeah. what have you. Yeah, yeah. Something to go at it. Yeah, yeah. With yeah. a given theme of something. So Absolutely. No, no, I think that's a great yeah. idea, too. I hadn't thought of the sort of, you know, the, the kind of three dimensional, you know, actually making, but I agree <laughs> totally that could really tap in as well. Because a lot of people are, are more creative, you know, with their hands and that, that kind of thing and think through that that way. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Oh, Gianna. Um, you showed some examples in your presentation of your own introspection as a researcher, as well as some of the introspections from your respondents. Could you talk a little bit about the difference in the insights you get from a researcher's introspection as compared to a consumer's introspection? All right. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think if you're, I, I didn't actually show examples of me introspecting, oh, by the way. Again, when you were talking about walking down the street. Oh, no, those were from the informants, actually. Uh, sorry if I didn't make that clear. Sorry, yeah. But, um, no, I think um, the insights that you get if, uh, as the researcher sensitize you, I think, more to what I would call the sort of cultural codes that are, you know, you may expect to find in the research. So it can be similar because I actually wrote a chapter uh, um, in one of Stephen Brown's books about the utopian imagination initially before um, I researched it. And, you know, uh, a lot of the things I find were subsequently, you know, what, what the informants were finding as well. But I think you use it in a different way, really, to, because you, you, you have to be careful, obviously, that you don't then go into the field with a completely predetermined mind because of your own reflections, you know. You, you want to make sure you stand stand back as well, but I think it sensitizes you to the kind of uh, richness that, that may be available to you. Yeah. Well, it's just interesting that you put it that way, that um, the, the, to, uh, you, you still need to maintain that distance, mm. because there's kind of a weird contradiction. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I, and I, I think it can be what Gianna yeah. raises an interesting point uh -huh. about this. Where is the space of your reflexivity mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. in the research? Mm -hmm. I've just been reading Henry Jenkins' mm -hmm. updated account of his Texas Poachers book from 20 years ago. Uh -huh. And the, I, re I highly recommend to everyone the first 20 or 30 pages, which is basically a discussion mm -hmm. between 
between him and Suzanne Scott mm -hmm. um, on this issue mm -hmm. of where to uh, where to, to place your presence mm -hmm. in, in such a way that it doesn't these in contradictions mm -hmm. of the you know the language of distance, yes. the discourse yeah. of us yeah. and them, yeah. and how to how to Oh, negotiate. Yeah, yeah, no, I think yeah, it is a very difficult one, actually. So, for instance, you know, when you're, yeah. you tend to privilege your presence. Yeah, yeah. And you're privileged to have the presence of the other person. Yeah. 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 I mean, I think there is, yes. You know, I, I think, what's Eric saying? <laughs> I mean, I... I yeah, co-conspirator, <laughs> co-conspirator. I mean, I, 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 I think you, I think that's a good way of putting it. Actually, that you are co-creating this experience in a way with your informants. Yeah, I think that's a nice way to think of it. I'm justified, actually. <laughs> Not trying to maintain your distance. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks very much.